All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for coming here to the International Student Experience Panel um, put on by Berkeley International Office. We have a really great panel of students for you today. Um, I'll just be introducing a little bit, um, but they're going to be doing most of the talking today. So uh, thank you to all our panelists for being able to be here. Um, we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, we're going to try and get as many questions for you guys as we can in the one hour that we have. Um, first of all, my name is Anna McCready. I'm an international student advisor here at Berkeley International Office. Um, I work as an international student advisor, so I work uh, primarily with immigration advising, um, but a lot of it goes into different areas such as academics, um, mental health, uh, health, uh, all sorts of areas. So if you ever have questions about anything to do with your international status, um, we're a really good first stop for you guys. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the webcams of the panelists so that you guys can see who is talking as I introduce everyone. Okay. Forgive me as I figure things out. Okay. There we go. Okay. And we're just going to do whoever is talking. So you should be able to see me, hopefully. Um, if we could get a raise of hands, you guys should have a little hand raise button if you can see my webcam and or hear my voice. Okay, great, I see a few hand raises. So it looks like technology is working okay for once in my life, so here we go. Um, as I said, my name is Anna McCready and I'm gonna introduce the panelists one by one. Uh, today we have Henry B. His home country is South Africa. Um, his major is data science and economics. He's pursuing a bachelor's degree here at UC Berkeley. Um, he's in his second year. And Henry, you're currently on campus, is that correct? Oh yes, that's right. Great, thank you for being here today, Henry. Thank you. Next we have Megan. Uh, Megan is not on just yet. She's finishing up one of her exams um, and then she'll be joining us in about five minutes. But Megan is from Taiwan. Um, she's pursuing a bachelor's in molecular environmental biology. She's in her first year, so a very exciting first year for Megan. And um, she is currently at home in Taiwan, so she has already returned to her home country. Next is Shining Chan. Shining's from Singapore, um, also pursuing a bachelor's here in LNS. She's also in your first year, so Shining, another <laughs> exciting first year for you. And um, you're currently at home in Singapore, is that right? Yes, that's right. And you guys can just call me Shin. Great. Thank you, Shin. Thank you so much for being here today. I know, especially for you guys who are um, international right now, that um, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, we have Yue Chu, who is originally from China. She's majoring in um, geology and also pursuing a bachelor's here. UAE is in her second year and she's currently staying um, in the East Bay area but not on campus. Is that right? Yeah, I'm staying at a family friend's house um, in the East Bay. Yeah. Great. All right, and our final panelist is Wen Jing Xu. Uh, Wen Jing is also from China. She is um, pursuing a PhD in environmental science policy and management. And uh, Wen Jing's in her fourth year and also currently in the East Bay area. Hi. Thanks, Wen Jing. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So you guys have met all of our panelists. Um, again, I'm gonna be letting them do most of the talking tonight. Um, the agenda for today is that there's gonna be a few moderated questions, just a few that we have come up with that we think would be helpful um, to cur for current international students to know, um, to spark some discussion. But the majority of the time I'm hoping to leave to you all, the attendees, there you can give your own questions um, and ask the panelists anything that you wanna know about their experience or um, what they've been dealing with in the past few weeks. So we are gonna go ahead and get started.
Um, you can see that our panelists are from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, we tried to find people from different countries, people from different um, education levels, people different majors, um, trying to get a really wide variety of panelists for you all today so that uh, we can kind of get a good cross section of uh, UC Berkeley international students. So the first topic we're gonna look at today is travel and housing. So how students have had to deal with changes in um, housing in the past few weeks, not to mention maybe returning to home country and dealing with that travel and just get a little insight into how that might have affected current students at UC Berkeley. So we're going to start with a question for the panelists who have um, returned to your home country. Uh, we're just wanting to know what that experience was like traveling internationally. Um, if you faced any difficulties traveling or maybe you got out before some of these travel bans. Um, or if you faced anything back in your home country, what that was like. Um, so if we have anyone here who wants to chime in. I guess that's me. <laughs> I left from San Francisco for Singapore on the 19th of March. So that was actually kind of before everything got so bad. And my experience is that the airport was a lot emptier than usual but everything was still really orderly and everything was calm and collected at the airport. And I didn't have much of an issue at all. Arriving home, everything was mostly normal as well. And the only change for me was that there was an additional temperature screening station at the gate. But oh, wow. I think that was all for me. And like I reached home before Singapore had a stay home notice uh, advisory. so. I think everything was okay for me. Everything seemed pretty normal, yeah. Do you feel lucky that you got out before some of the big travel changes? Definitely, yes. And I got back to Singapore before a lot of the changes here happened as well. So I still kind of got a few days of normal life, even though I mostly stayed home then as well. And do you know, is it still possible to travel from US to Singapore at this, like right now, or um, have things changed very much? I think it is possible for Singapore citizens to come home, but besides that, I don't think other travelers are allowed into Singapore. And I know that a lot of airlines have canceled their flights and Singapore's airlines have canceled most of their flights. So I think from San Francisco, there might not be any, there might not be any easy flights back anymore. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Shin. Um, I know Megan also traveled back to her home country, so we might have her chime in um, when she gets on in just a few minutes. But for now, we're going to move on to the students who stayed in the Bay Area. Um, we're just wondering what changes have been to their what changes have there been to your housing if you've moved to a different housing location um, or in your living arrangements. How have things changed here with your housing? Anyone can feel free to, to chime in. Um, so I, uh, because I was living with two elderly housemates, so I just moved temporarily with, moving temporarily with my partner. So to avoid that, um, too much contact with the elderly housemate makes me feel that I'm putting them at risk. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess another question um, I have for you panelists who remained here in the US, um, I'm curious to hear if you thought about returning home and um, what kind of uh, what made you decide or what helped with that decision to stay here in the US. Um, uh, I feel I'll like go on that. Okay. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah, I'm I'm still on campus because you know, when the virus broke out in the United States, the first thought was, you know, I, I got to go back to home. Um, but usually when I go back to home, I have to take a flight to New York because I was I, I also used to live in New York. So then when I when I contact my brother, he was in New York. Right. And then he told me that six of his friend had the, already had symptoms of the virus. So immediately, immediately I had to like, you know, unbug my flight because I was kind of concerned that you know, stopping at New York might, you know, give me a chance of getting the virus. So I had to um, cancel the flight and then remain on campus. And other than that, uh, nothing really changed to my housing plans. Me and my roommate were still 
here on campus. And yeah, it's except for the only changes is that we're not going to classes anymore. But other than that, it's the same. It's pretty much just regular daily routine. Right, right, except that you got to cook more. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, I moved to my family friend's house because um, originally I live in Berkeley on a off-campus housing, but all my housemates are um, Californians, so they just went back home immediately when classes are canceled. And um, due to the concern of me living in a large house alone may not be that safe or like just in general. So I just moved to a family friend's house in the Bay Area. Um, and I don't plan to go back to China for a while because like now international flights are really hard to get and uh, the way going back may be dangerous and it will take a long time. Even if I go back to my home country, they, they require for um, self-quarantine and a lot of supervising and testing going on. And it just makes things really complicated. And I am still like having online classes right now. So I don't want to make my life that complicated. So I just decided to stay here. Great, I think thank you. Um, I just want to add something just like me being grad students probably make it more easy to make the decision that I um, need to stay here instead of going home. Um, also, China isn't like much better situation when the US started to uh, get worse. So um, yeah, so it's not, I haven't actually thought of the option of going home. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks all so much for sharing. Um, I think it's it's interesting to me to see um, what people's perspectives are, who wants to go home, who wants to stay, who's able to travel. Um, we're actually sending out, Berkeley International Office is sending out a survey shortly just to kind of get a pulse on um, where students are and how many actually have gone home. Because it's a little difficult to tell, I think anecdotally, it feels like many students have left the area but i think in reality quite a few have stayed um similar to this this panel um it's kind of seems like uh kind of a split down the middle but um that survey will be coming out shortly so if anyone would like to take it that will give us kind of a more accurate idea of um how many students have returned home and how many have stayed and um, what they're doing so thank you all next question um, what has been the biggest change to your daily routine? So Henry, you said cooking more. <laughs> That's definitely been true for me as well. But um, if there's any other big yes. changes to your daily routine. Um, except for, since, you know, cooking is quite a hassle, usually for, um, usually because previously before, you know, the pandemic started, um, I had a meal plan, so usually you know, I can just go out to, you know, the Cafe 3 or those type of places to eat out or, you know, just go to, you know, local restaurants and do some takeouts. But after, um, you know, this situation got worse, um, my parents didn't really want me to do takeouts anymore. And they kind of forced me into, you know, cooking by myself. And cooking is actually not that bad. It's just that you, you have to go buy the groceries which is kind of a pain um because you're you're basically putting yourself in a situation of exposing to the virus and usually you know when i'm on my way to the you know local safeway you know i'm geared up and getting a lot of weird looks which is you know i mean i i, I mean i understand it but you know i'm just trying to protect myself so yeah just just for anyone else that's um here in the states you know, try to try to stay at home as much as you can. And then whenever you decide to leave the house, you got to plan ahead what, what exactly you want to buy and how many items. You know, it's best to prep for like two weeks so then you minimize your time outside. Great. Thanks, Henry. Anyone else have thoughts about biggest change to daily routine? I mean, 
I guess since I'm in a different country, there's quite a lot of changes in my daily routine. <laughs> For example, like I'm, I have a 16 hour time difference and that kind of, it was a bit messy when I first got back, but after, I guess after a while, I'm more used to staying at home again. And then there's also the fact that when I came home, I'm living with my parents again. So it's like being away from my parents and then coming back for so many months to live under their roof again. That is a, a kind of a change, yeah. Um, yeah. For me, I feel the biggest difference is because I'm in the marching band and normally during spring semester, we'll also have a lot of performance like every other day and sometimes we'll have some small rehearsals with friends, but now um, because everything is shutting down, we are canceling all our re uh, rehearsals and performance, so like a lot of my um, usual entertainment things are like closing down and I cannot do them anymore. Sometimes I try to practice instruments in the house, but I know that all the neighbors are also um, around in their house. So I don't want to like bother them that often with my instrument. So yeah, definitely I feel that part of my life changed a lot after the pandemic. Yeah, I think it's good to remember that um, not only school has been affected, obviously, not just academics, but extracurriculars and then so many different aspects of your life. So we have to think about not only how are we going to learn differently and how are we going to live differently, but also reorganizing many large aspects of your life. Yeah, for me, it's not too many big changes, I think, comparing to many other people. Uh, maybe most largest changes just like i don't move that much anymore but it's like for everyone um yeah so but like i as a grad student like i always cook for myself so it's not that much changing that sense and then i don't have a lot of classes um it's just mostly meetings and now to change them to online um um yeah so I think comparing to many other people, my life has been relatively stable. <laughs> Great, okay, we're gonna move on to the next section, which is we're talking about um, academics and remote learning and how um, you've been dealing with that these past few weeks. So I know for some students, this is probably an easier transition than others. Um, I think lecture-based classes they're fairly easy to transition to remote learning and um, Zoom meetings, but some others, especially like lab-based classes, or um, for example, with Wenjing, if you're doing research, how that has changed um, with, with remote learning and how you've been dealing with that. So in this section, we wanted to ask, what has been the single greatest challenge or adjustment to remote learning in terms of your academics? Um, and this could also be um, time difference, um, anything that you've had to deal with that has been difficult? I think that for me, the single greatest challenge would just be the fact that there is no regular classes to attend anymore. And I guess I am lucky in the fact that most of my classes have recordings available. So in Singapore, I don't have to survive on PST, but I know that some of my friends are doing that. So they're here in Singapore, but they're sleeping at like in the afternoon and waking up at like 3 a.m. to attend classes and stuff. So I think that's definitely going to be more difficult for them. But for me, it's just that there's a lot less structure because I can kind of watch my lectures anytime I want. And that means that my motivation is like not there, but it's OK, I guess. And is that true for most classes at Berkeley that they've gone to recordings or are there some that you know of that are still um, have to be a certain time? I'm not very sure about that. I know that my classes can do recordings and I think that some of my friends are surviving on PSD because they want to participate in live lectures. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? Um, for me, I'm taking four geology classes and one reading and composition class uh, this semester. 
And I feel compared to my reading class, my geology class has been um, really impact because um, geology class, we have a lot of lab to look at rocks and we also have field trips to um, finish the like question sets and do project based on the field trip. And because of the pandemic, like my four classes combined, we canceled um, a total of nearly 40 days of field trip this semester. So that is a huge amount. And one of my classes just gives everybody incomplete so we can complete it next uh, spring. Um, and for the other classes, the professors try to use substitute methods like giving out papers or other online materials to try to compromise the loss of labs and um, field trip. But I definitely feel that um, when these things turn online, it's like a different feeling. And yeah, definitely I feel that is the biggest challenge for the geology classes. Yeah, for me, I think it's mostly when I was um, meeting with my students, um, it, because it's not in person, so it's really hard to make them engaged. Um, and, and it's pretty easy for anyone just to be distracted by like something happened in their own environment. So sometimes it's harder to get a hold of what they are actually thinking. So like in order to like check in their progress, um, similar to my grad seminar, um, but in terms of research, I'm pretty lucky because most of my research is done on the computer. Um, but for example, like my partner, he basically brought back all the lab equipment uh, from his lab. So like, here is like a microscope. And then oh <laughs> just on this table that I'm using right now, we have like two microscopes and then he has like snails and stuff just across the table. So yeah. Um, uh but like so like for us we are still lucky i know some other grad students like if you need to have like really high uh requirement for like lab settings then it's impossible for you to do any kind of uh uh experiment anymore um but for sure like like my lab uh my field work uh that's early in the summer that's probably going to be pending at this moment um then it's impossible to do any planning which is kind of very rare for any grad student to not do any planning for the foreseeable future. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think I am still, again, like I'm lucky in so many ways. I feel really grateful of my situation right now. Thanks. And Henry, any changes in your academics? Uh, yes, um, there are definitely pros and cons um, for pros because um, Previously, for my data classes, <laughs> since my class are so huge that I've already gone into the normal, you know, I've I I would rather just watch the lectures before uh, instead of going in person. So you know, the transition isn't too bad. And in fact, you know, for some for one of my data classes, um, to be honest, the professor, you know, she made the class more efficient in some ways because there aren't that many. Because when you watch lectures, you usually, you know, watch it on two times the speed. But, you know, when the when the professor uh, introduced this new way of teaching, um, she she kind of condensed the curriculum. So, I mean, that's so everything is kind of very dense, but you can definitely have time to pause and then really think about it. And then, you know, maybe switch it up what you're confused and then go back to the lecture and watch it but you cannot really do that in person. So I found that, you know, kind of interesting. And for cons, um, definitely staying motivated since you're basically in the room the entire time. And then, um, you know, everything is on YouTube. So there are suggestions, so you kind of get distracted from that. <laughs> so, yeah. Great, thanks, Henry. I'm um, also just pause here. I noticed that, um, I see Megan just joined, um, but it's looked like it, there's an issue with the audio. Um, we'll just wait. I guess we'll keep going and wait and see if Megan will be able to join us. Uh, Megan, 
feel free to chime in as you're able. Um, so thanks everyone for sharing. It's really interesting for oh, me to hear um, all the different responses people have had and all the different things that you're having to deal with. Um, I think there's been a wide range of changes. Like, um, as I said at the beginning, some classes are definitely more affected than others. Some is a pretty easy transition. As Shin was saying, hers are pretty fairly easy. Um, but then there's the other in the spectrum where some classes might have to pause until next spring to complete some requirements, um, or some people doing research are not even able to access what they need to access and are on pause for the foreseeable future. So um, definitely a very wide range. Um, I'm really happy that Henry brought up pros and cons rather than just cons, because that kind of leads right into our next question. Um, so what do you think is a benefit or a silver lining of learning remotely? Um, anyone can chime in on this one, doesn't have to go through every single presenter, but uh, if there's any silver lining that you can think of, any benefits that you've noticed that you enjoy more than actually um, doing in-person learning, um, I thought we could just throw those out there and see what anyone thought. I feel personally, um, I am more comfortable typing in my question to the Zoom chat to ask the professor doing his lectures because Normally, when um, I attend a lecture in like 50 people, and I somehow I sometimes feel awkward to just raise my hand. Other times, just don't know when to interrupt the professor. But with this chat thing, I can just type in my question, and my professor can see it and can choose when to answer my question. And I feel that definitely helped me and a lot of other students to be more active in classes to ask questions. Yeah, great point, UAE. For me, I feel that a silver lining is that I have returned to an environment where I am. I believe that I am a little bit more productive because I grew up here in Singapore and I spent years here studying and studying and studying for <laughs> national exams and everything. So maybe because I, at Cal, I haven't found like my favorite study spot and everything, but I feel that coming back home, it actually sometimes makes it easier for me to get everything done. Yeah. So that's oh, sorry, Shin, you said this was your first year here at Cal, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so you're probably still still getting adjusted. And you have that really cool cow pillow that you can be really <laughs> comfy while you study. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Um like a really weird benefit for me would be like the humorous aspect of it because I've joined like a lot of Zoom memes groups on <laughs> Facebook and like all of the memes are like high quality and I just find that there are a lot of like funny things happening on Zoom meetings and I just think if people like try to take it not as seriously it would be better to like relax in this really not relaxed situation and I just I, I spent like the first like five minutes of this chat trying to turn on my microphone and I blasted like a hundred percent of that like volume into my brain and I just like oh, popped no. while everyone was talking I just find it it's like a thing that you can't take lightly to me for me yeah Great, I love it. Remote lear learning is great for the memes. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Megan. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to go on to um, the last section here, and then we'll open up to questions from participants. So um, this section is just looking at staying healthy, both mentally and physically. So um, what precautions you're taking and um, how you're staying busy and healthy, healthy and happy. So um, first one, what health measures are being taken in your home countries regarding the outbreak and what is daily life like there? So we already heard a little bit about um, Singapore and um, what it's like there, but for anyone else who wants to share a little bit about um, what it's like in your home country right now, we would love to hear about it. Anyone I can all? go. Um, <laughs> yes. So, you know, I was trying to return back home because my parents really wanted me to go back. 
so then um but then you know the country south africa they they um kind of closed their border for you know the uh, the countries that are affected by coronavirus and usa is one of it so currently i cannot return back to the country until the 16th um i'm trying to book a flight you know around the 20th i don't know why the price is so expensive for right now but um yeah definitely south africa took a lot of um, precautions they closed the border immediately they have like a 21 day shutdown where you can't really go outside except for grocery shopping and if you're if you're caught up being outside doing some random stuff they will actually punish you by like doing all sort of like i said saw these videos where they punish you doing push-ups and random stuff and doing random errands so you don't want to go outside and i don't think they're doing that here in the states right because whenever i go outside there there are a bunch of people running and doing random stuff but I don't think, do they find you if you're going outside for a random yeah. purpose or? It sounds like they're treating it a little more that. seriously than the U.S. is. So um, currently in the U.S., there's no fine for being outside. You can walk around, you can take the dog out. Um, but there is a fine for, I believe, for assembling or gathering in groups. So if you're seen in large groups of people that you do not um, immediately live with, then there could be a fine for that. I think the measures in China is probably pretty well reported by media. Uh, so I don't know how much I need to go into that. Um, but currently, uh, like, because my parents are not from the Hubei province, so they can go out as normal, but still everyone is wearing masks. Um, so I think that's still like a pretty good measure to prevent the second wave. Um, and, and, everyone has a QR code. Uh, the QR code shows your status, whether you can be out or not. And then if they scan it and then it's green, that means you're okay. And if it's red, that means you are like breaking whatever the regulation and they will either find, I don't know what's the mesh, like the punishment of they find out that you're red. Um, oh, that's so interesting. That's such an interesting use of technology. Yeah, they have a lot of good <laughs> use of technology. <laughs> Great, thanks, Wenjing. Anyone else want to share what things are like in their home country? Um, for Taiwan, there are certainly a lot of concerns mm -hmm. about medical supplies, especially masks, because we've been like we've been pretty cautious about this since about December. So like everyone has been buying a lot of masks. So the government has put a limit on um, the masks that you can buy. So we're currently running on um, like a, you get like a nine, nine mask cap per 14 days. And you can also order the mask online. And it, we also have an app that tells you which stores still have masks available. So I think that's like a good thing for the people to kind of like calm down about medical supplies and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Oh, speaking of masks, I think that Singapore is doing something interesting because the gov in the in the government's efforts to try to like make us not buy so many masks, the government has been distributing masks to every single family in Singapore, kind of regularly. Like they did one round of that early on with like they give like about four masks per family for emergency use and. Recently, I think yesterday or the day before, the government distributed like reusable masks. So I think they're cloth masks to every family so that they don't have to go out and buy masks and like cut the supply for the country and the medical workers. Yeah. Well, that's great. Okay, we're just gonna move through these last, uh, we have two more questions. These are pretty quick ones and then we will open it up to everyone else. Um, next one is, um, we talked a little bit about um, not only academics being affected, but also all of your extracurriculars, uh, maybe many of your hobbies might not be able to be what they were before. So what what have you been doing with your pastime? What hobbies are you able to do from home and how have you been spending your time? I've been doing a lot of gardening and um, it's a great time to do a lot of gardening. 
and we have a great large garden. So, yeah. Um, I've been sketching a lot because I like drawing. And I also try to design some shows for my marching band because um, I will be in charge for designing the show for next season. So I just try to motivate myself to think ahead, like, what if the pandemic just like begun in the fall and like everything will be normal and I should like prepare for the fall. So I kind of just do some show design. Very cool. Um, I spend a lot of time with my pets, but I find that like um, planning for the the planning for show thing, I find that like also pretty like it's a it's a useful pastime to do to like think ahead for the next semester because all of my club activities has been postponed. But then like I find it easy to forget that it's one day it's still happening. So I think it's also a good thing to like plan ahead and kind of think of what you want to achieve in next semesters of clubs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Henry, I think you're last. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. For me, um, definitely, um, you know, first thing I, one thing that I found myself doing is, you know, video chatting my friends a lot. You know, I have friends in, South Africa, friends in New York, and friends here. So, you know, I, you know, whenever I get bored, I'll just, you know, we chat my friends and then we we have this group group call, which is, you know, we, we can talk about the stress and how it's been, how life has been changed due to this virus. And also for me, it's like, you know, a lot of time just, since I'm having a lot of free time, um, one thing that I do is, you know, you really can self-reflect and you know explore my passions um you know previous as a data science major um there are a lot of you know free data on 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 the website and you know from websites such as you know john john hopkins they have the data on you know people who the number of people who are infected and all that so i'm doing a little side projects on the you know the, the effects of uh, coronavirus on the United States, especially in New York in general. And I'm just, you know, applying, well, I'm learning in class, you know, the skills and doing some basic data analysis on my own, just for interest, since I have so much free time. So, you know, why not? Great, thanks Henry. I think also um, Shen, we missed you. Oh, yes. Um... Okay, I have some things that I've been doing and some things that I, it's a goal that I want to do. So there's stuff like picking up books for leisure again, which haven't really been finding that much time to do. And I want to try playing with watercolors, write cards for friends and get exercise for sure. And then also because now we have so much free time and alone time and everything. I think that I agree with Henry, it's a good time to do like more self-reflection, do some quiet thinking, get some downtime and everything, yeah. Great, that's great advice. Um, and that leads us directly into our last question. Um, so I think this, a lot of what you guys said in the last question will play into this, um, talking about making goals, planning for the future, um, staying active, trying new things. But um, if you have any other advice, maybe just a few people to throw out um, if they have any thoughts on how to stay positive during times of stress and isolation, um, how to, to keep active and keep happy. I would say get changes to your environment regularly because it really gets quite tiring and taxing to stay in this one spot or one room all the time. So if you have different rooms, go to different rooms. If you have a yard, go outside. If you have a balcony, sit on it. And I think that really helps for me. Yeah, I feel the same because like for the first two weeks I had to do self-quarantine back home, I kind of just stayed in the same spot with like my pets. And I kind of just like laid there for 14 hours straight. And then kind of like by the end, I felt like I was like, the part a part of my couch 
and it felt really bad. And I started like moving around, and it felt much better. And I also find um, like workout workout programs that had like um, timed timed workout programs really helpful because they kind of like you kind of have this like um, set out program that has like day one to day 12 for you so you kind of just follow through and you kind of like it takes your mind off of other things and you just like keep your mind on achieving that really simple goal um one advice i will add is you know if you're really bored or you know have nothing to do um i recently discovered that you know there are various podcasts um during during there are some are su subscription based and some of some of them are free but you know you know if you're really interested in some fields for example for me it's like you know the financial industry um because i'm also trying to find internships uh in this field um one thing that i'm doing is i'm finding myself listening to various podcasts um whether it is about the global economic crisis or you know how this virus has impacted various small business and you know the crazy unemployment rate is sparking up um you know instead of just you know watching youtube and all that stuff i i realize you know sometimes i need to spend my time more efficiently and you know podcast is a really great way to just you know close your eyes and just listen for a half an hour to an hour to what people around you know they're saying and yeah take take use really take use of this time because you know usually during school days we will complain you know i don't want to go to class but right now we don't have class like everything is online you basically have to figure out a new way of spending your time so yeah that's one of my advice to you very true. I'll be honest, though, I don't think the, those podcasts don't sound like a very good way to stay positive. They're all about the, the economic recession and unemployment. <laughs> but I, I get your point that it's it's definitely a good time to utilize suddenly all this free time that you have and uh, put it towards maybe interests that you didn't have time for before, which is great. I agree with Harry. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, I'll go ahead. Um, I, I agree with Harry that learning new stuff and knowledge in general just keep people going and make us feel uh, clear of what we're doing right now and like trying to be productive. I feel it's a really good way to stay positive. And I feel it's important sometimes for us to remember that it is still school year and we're still taking those classes and having exams coming up. So one thing I find um, helpful for me is to just like reflect on what kind of assignment that I have like just throw away during the semester. Like sometimes it's like not required readings and other times it's like some optional homework. And now I just have more time because I don't need to commute around classes. So I just try to pick those um, learning materials up and like, try to tell myself it is my chance to get ahead of my classes it is my chance to like uh, crush this class so I, I feel that really motivates me to keep all my classes going and having a good attitude yeah um i think there are some in creative ways of using zooms uh I know some people are using Zoom so much, so it's like a little bit afraid of this app I mean, like right now. But like friends, friends and I, we were schedule uh, schedule regular um, meeting time after working time and just chat and just like normal if we are running each other in hallways and we would just chat. So we just do very meaningless talking, but that's kind of fun. Uh, and I also started to look back to some travel pictures and like videos that I've been taking in the past. So like during my really fun experience time, but I never had time to really organize them. Um, so now it's really good time to look at this uh, good memories. Uh, yeah, and that, that really like brought me back 
some happiness that I have been experiencing when I was on the trip. So I think that really helped. Great, thank you guys. Um, okay, we are gonna go ahead and open it up um, to any current attendees who have questions. Um, if you have anything you wanna ask the panelists, any thoughts about um, what things are like in their home countries, how they're dealing with various things that have happened in the last few months, you can go ahead and type it into the chat um, or write it as a question in the question panel. Um, either way is fine. We'll just wait a few minutes to see if anyone has questions, but it could be that there are no questions and you guys answered everyone's questions perfectly. <laughs> we'll see. So we could go, oh, here we go. So we have one question. Um, how is the weather right now? <laughs> How's the weather? So some of you here are here in the Bay Area. So we had a, a lovely rainy day today. Um, it actually felt kind of nice to be in. Um, you know, it felt like you were just inside on a rainy day because it's rainy, not because of anything else. But uh, maybe for the people that are abroad, um, how has your weather been? Taiwan has been pretty weird. It was it was like t-shirt weather just like two weeks ago and then it's all of a sudden like sweater weather again and it's also been raining and it's just, it just kind of sucks <laughs> but also it like keeps you home and it like takes your mind off of the whole quarantine thing. Singapore's weather is very very different from the Bay Area we're a tropical country so it's like over 30 degrees Celsius that's like 80 plus every day all the time and that's kind of sad. <laughs> yeah we don't have uh, that here that's for sure. <laughs> Great um, okay this question for everyone um, are you I guess this I guess it's actually mostly to the students who are abroad right now but are you concerned about not being able to return to Berkeley in the next few weeks or possibly months and did this uh, influence your decision to stay or to go back to your home country? Um, so definitely ease of travel and um, when these travel bans will be lifted is a big topic of conversation in the immigration world right now and international student world. Um, so um, is that something that you thought of when you were trying to make the decision and is it something that you are concerned about? I am concerned about it and like my situation is a little bit more complicated because I was supposed to go and study abroad next semester so right now I'm just I have no idea where to buy my return ticket even to but I kind of I came home because I have more faith in the Singapore medical infrastructure and my friends and family are here so I guess it didn't affect my decision that much and because I know that a lot of other Singaporeans in Berkeley also came back. So we have to figure something out eventually. Yeah. Okay, and maybe Megan, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, it was a pretty big part of my decision. And I had like, actually all of my Taiwanese friends went back home like four to five days earlier than me. And I just stayed there like almost an extra week to figure it out. Cause I would suggest every anyone who's like thinking about weighing the options to just make a master list of the pros and cons. And eventually I thought like there's, if there is gonna be a travel ban, there's really nothing we can do about it. And it's, I, I don't think it would be a good idea to like stay because you're you're afraid of not being able to return instead of like uh, prioritizing your health and like the things that you think matter the most. So eventually I came back and I think the the thing that really matters is just doing the like the first, like the most right thing for you, like at the moment, just try to lift your mind off of the like consequences of your action now, because it's gonna, like the situation is evolving so fast and you won't know 
the consequences of your action now. So I just find it easier to make a decision if you think of it that way. Yeah, I think that's really and helpful. I'd like to add it. that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'd like to add that I feel like there can always be alternative like things to do. Like if we really find that we are not able to go back to the US, I'm sure the international office is going to help us out and like the embassies and everything, they do understand that there are strange circumstances going on. So I don't think, and like all the international students at Berkeley are kind of experiencing the same thing. So maybe it's not something that we have to worry about that much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's both, both of those are true. I think everyone can only make that decision for themselves. And there's so much that goes into that decision. So um, I will say that Berkeley International Office we're not recommending travel right now, but that is only a recommendation based off of immigration information. Um, it has nothing to do with your own personal health and safety, with wanting to be home with family, um, with like employment opportunities. There's all of these things that go into your decision and really only you can really weigh all of the different factors and decide what is best for yourself. And I will also echo that if this does go on for the next few weeks, months, um, you know, we can't say one way or another. I'm very hopeful that it will, it will not, but we really can't say. Um, and if it does, then obviously UC Berkeley and Berkeley International Office will be working hard to figure out accommodations um, for any students that happen to be trapped overseas or unable to re-enter the U.S. Okay. Um, we, I just want to highlight, we have one student that uh, typed they are a grad student of the journalism school and they're writing a story on the effect of COVID-19 on international students. Um, they have their email in the chat. So if you're interested in um, getting in touch and wanting to share your story, then feel free to reach out. Um, these, this is a great question. Um, do any of you have plans for the summer? So I know it's hard to be planning ahead for an advance, but um, if, if you're thinking of doing an internship over the summer, if you're staying in your home country, um, what are your kind of immediate plans for the summer? Um, for me, um, right now I'm still interviewing for a few positions here in the state and in the Bay Area and one in New York, but I'm kind of confused because they it seemed like they are positive that the virus is gonna go away. So then they are saying like, oh, we will recommend that uh, we will have, like one of the internships is like, uh, we, we recommend like once uh, in person every two weeks. I was kind of confused about that because I don't think any, any um, I don't know. I don't think any company should be doing in person. I don't know why they are making that assumption, but if that doesn't work out, I'm also looking for internship in South Africa. And, you know, uh, most of them are becoming remote. So um, it really depends. It depends on the company and how they deal with the internship, and the, the, the program. Yeah, that's that's currently my plan. If, if I don't get an internship, I guess I'll take take the opportunity of taking the summer classes because um, it's again online which is quite flexible and also a good time just to learn new stuff and fulfill your credits. Yeah I agree I I actually am going to uh, plan to take some summer classes either in Berkeley or some GRE classes because I plan to apply to grad school um, I think I will also read more papers and think about my senior thesis. Yeah, just try to use that time to study. Great, maybe one more person. Any summer plans coming up soon? I feel like internships are not the easiest to find right now because a lot of job, a, a lot of workplaces aren't open and a lot of people are cutting like cutting people and everything so they're not really willing to offer you an additional position but if I'm still looking for one in Singapore but I'm not sure if that's going to work out and if it doesn't I feel like another path we can go on is always to just work on our own site projects 
we can whatever we've been meaning to do or thinking about but not doing because we've been too busy with school and everything i think this summer might be a good time to start those great um, I have a question here specifically about um, OPT and if anyone else is waiting for OPT. Um, I know none of you panelists are dealing with the OPT application right now because none of you are completing your program this year, um, but I can just give a quick shout out to OPT. Um, there, so there currently has been no information about whether OPT will be delayed or not. Um, we're kind of going in under the assumption that it will be processed as usual. There hasn't been any announcements of any delays and USCIS has announced delays in other areas. So uh, we're hoping that because they have announced delays in some areas but haven't said anything about OPT that they're still holding to the, the usual timeline. Um, but we will only be able to find out for sure once they start approving this round of OPTs. So um, we should have an idea shortly of a kind of an estimated timeline once they start approving OPTs that applied this semester. Um, in terms of traveling with OPT, for that, I highly recommend um, talking with a Berkeley International Office advisor because it is pretty complicated traveling under OPT, um, even normally, and now it's even obviously more complicated. So um, check in with us first if you're thinking of traveling and you have a, a pending OPT application. Um, okay, we have a PhD student who was hoping that Wenjin could share a little bit more about coping with um, grad school life and um, worries about doing field work. Um, Wenjin, if you want to say a little bit um, uh, just about yeah, um, how it's been affecting you. Yeah, so I do have some, uh, I did have some preliminary field work plan for early summer. And right now I have been putting it on hold. And I think it's actually, uh, for me, uh, not able to collect more data or validate any data is um, one, it's actually one way to tell me that it's time to do more reading and writing. And it ha actually recently, uh, this actually is one silver lining for me uh, in this moment because uh, with all the meeting or online classes, things are becoming so flexible. So I think it's a really good time to start to uh, organize things according to your own time, especially for reading and writing that you need a big chunk of time, maybe just sitting there and thinking about things. And I actually think right now is super great to do that. Um, and I've been writing a lot recently. And I think for grad student, it's never too much to have it's never like the time is never too much for reading and writing. Um, so in terms of field work, um, if right now things couldn't um, be conducted as expected, then maybe there are there's ex, uh, ex, maybe there are options for available data set for doing uh, preliminary testing on the concept that you have. Or I've been actually seeing people sharing data set on. Twitter uh, because they're recognizing that the collecting data phase is difficult for many researchers right now. So yeah, I would suggest to go on Twitter and there are a lot of, like academic chatter hashtag. There are a lot of people sharing experience and uh, tips of how to uh, use this time the best. Um, yeah, hope this helps. Great, thank you so much. Um, we are at time um i wish we go a little bit longer because we did have a couple other questions um but i also don't want to keep anyone more than an hour so um, i just want to say thank you very very much to the panelists um, for being here today and just sharing your experiences and um being open and willing to to be here and to talk with people um we really appreciate you taking the time and for for just being here today. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for all the people that attended. Um, we will send out this um, webinar as a recording, so um, you can feel free to go back through and, and share it with friends or anyone else that you think it would be helpful for. And um, please stay tuned for future events from Berkeley International Office. We're doing several different virtual events where you can connect with other international students um, and continue to have some conversations and stay connected with the international student community. Um, so thank you, panelists. Thank you, attendees. And uh, we'll see you all hopefully back on campus very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.